Hello students, welcome to lecture 4. In this lecture, we will review human brain structure and its function. The outline of today's lecture is as follows. First, we will see different lobes of the brain, midbrain and hindbrain, different parts of the brain. Uh, we will also discuss structure and the function of a neuron. And in the last part, we will see uh, synaptic transmission uh, procedure. I will define what is this synaptic transmission. So the brain, as you can see in this image, is perhaps the most complex organ in human body. Right? Although only uh, it weighs around uh, 1.3 kilogram in the average adult, all the behavior, actions, thoughts, um, and feeling origins that originate from this brain, which has billions of neural and networks okay, interacting to create what we recognize as, as human. Well, without the brain, our bodies uh, simply would not function. This is the most important, of, of course, body part we have. And understanding of its structure and function is a very good time to take a look before moving into details of VCI research. So, if you look at this brain, there are some distinctive uh, characteristics such as folds, nu numerous folds, that give it its uh, kind of wrinkled appearance. So we have some different folding. This folding together with uh, of the brain tissue allows for a greater amount of uh, surface, cerebral surface. This is called cerebral surface. Approximately, let's say, two-thirds of uh, cerebral, cerebral uh, surface area is located uh, in depth of these folds, two-thirds, to be confined with the uh, limited uh, space of the skull. So the grooves are these grooves are called fissures and they extend deep into the brain or um, we can also call them as sulci if they are shallower and, and these bumps that we see here are called gyri these bumps are called gyri the sulci gyri okay these grooves so the gyri and then sulci allows us to identify region of the brain uh, in mapping, for instance, in building the brain map. Gyri and sulci. The brain has different compartments, different parts. As you can see here, forebrain and the midbrain and hid uh, hind brain. But the we 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 call this as uh, the the cerebrum is the largest part, this part. Of the brain and fills the entire upper portion of the, the cranium. So it consists of two cerebral uh, hemispheres. This is the, the real brain. Real brain example. And it surrounds uh, the brain stem, which is this part or this part. Okay, the brain stem leads to the spinal cord. Right? Typically, um, for most people, the left, left hemisphere will be dominant because most people are uh, right-handed. And then, the left hemisphere is known to be responsible for production of language, mathematical ability, uh, problem-solving logic, while right hemisphere is thought to be responsible for uh, creativity and then space, uh, spatial ability. And this uh, cerebrum, okay, this cerebrum, this uh, upper part is called cerebrum. And we, well, we define one more thing we call as a cortex. The cortex is the upper layer of this uh, cerebrum, the upper, outer layer of the cerebrum, okay, which consists of the 80% of the, the entire brain. Further, we can separate the brain into four different lobes, as color-coded here. The frontal lobe. This parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. 
let's go uh, one by one and describe their uh, functions. So frontal lobe is located in the front of both cerebral hemispheres. The frontal lobes are the and uh, the largest lobes of the brain, and uh, also the precise area of this primary motor cortex, okay, primary motor cortex, which is very important in BCI, represent a particular area of body. For example, um, the middle area, middle area of the cortex controls the legs. Okay. The lateral area is for muscle of the face, and the largest uh, area represented is the arm and hands, which is located between both of these areas. So, primary motor cortex is located on uh, frontal lobe. It is a very uh, interesting, uh, very important part of our, the brain, uh, relevant to brain machine interface research. Yeah, so, primary motor cortex. Uh, Premotor cortex summary, and we use, as I mentioned, sulcus as a reference. So, sulcus is these uh, lines, right? These lines that uh, separate central sulcus that separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. <coughs> so, posterior parietal lobe is responsible. Uh, for transforming visual information into motor command. The premotor cortex, uh, which is located here, also responsible for motor guidance of movement and control of, uh, for instance, proximal and, uh, and then trunk muscles of human body. We also have a supplementary motor area on uh, frontal lobe, which is responsible for planning, coordination, and complex movements such as <coughs> those uh, requiring uh, both hands, two hands. Also, uh, frontal lobe contains a Broca area, which is very uh, popular, famous area in the brain, uh, for motor, uh, used for motor production of speech. Right. Uh, in terms of function. The frontal lobe is uh, responsible okay, for, per for personality, judgment, insight, reasoning, mathematical uh, reasoning, problem solving, uh, abstract thinking, and working memory. memory. The frontal lobe is very important. So it's, uh, I would say intelligent reasoning, intelligence is located in on the frontal lobe. And our personality is encoded in on the frontal lobe. Yes. So the Broca's area, which I mentioned, uh, is also located in the front lobe. This is uh, the front side and back side of the brain. This is because it's in front lobe. And if you have some damage in this area, okay, which uh, will damage your ability to produce motor movements of speech, you won't be able to uh, speak. So another lobe of the brain is called parietal lobe, which is located in this region, in this uh, color coded region, okay, which includes somatosensory cortex, which receives general sensory information, this somat somatosensory cortex, and uh, also initial um, reception of tactile that relates touch, pain, temperature, or, uh, or kind of pr proper, uh, proprioceptive sense of position information as well. So the, the main role of parietal lobe are complex aspects of uh, spatial orientation, and also perception, uh, what else, um, and the comprehension of language function and the ability to recognize objects by touching okay and also mm, writing calculating uh, so those, those kind of um, functions are uh, are related
using to find it on Cortex. And posterior or in the backside, the posterior area of the parietal lobe appear to link to the, the visual somatosensory information together. And damage to this area can lead to uh, sensory uh, problems, sensory deficits, and spatial orientation problems, and also perception problems. Another lobe of the cerebrum is called temporal lobe here, which is located here. And it is involved in receiving and processing auditory information. Also, uh, also responsible for higher order visual information or complex aspects of memory, language, and understanding of language. These functions are related to temporal lobe. Also, they include uh, things like abstract thought, judgment, control, control of written and verbal language skills. Temporal lobe includes uh, Wernicke's area, which is primarily responsible for comprehension of speech and closely linked to, uh, to Broca's area, which we discussed, so that produces speech. So damage to this area can lead to uh, problems related to comprehension of speech or producing the speech. Now let's talk about this part of the brain, which we call as occipital lobe. Okay, the primary visual cortex, which receives raw sensory information from the eye of the human, from the retina, uh, process information uh, on color, color, okay, also object and facial recognition, uh, and is also involved in perceiving the motion. Those are some of the uh, functions related to occipital lobe. Okay, this lobe also allows for the transmission of information between two hemispheres and damage to visual cortex located in occipital lobe causes cortical blindness so most of the uh, blind people have damage to this area as all structures um, to see are in intact but the person cannot perceive the input from the center we are interested in BCI BMI research in this uh, occipital lobe because most of the uh, visual stimuli based BCI utilize the data acquired from this part of the brain. Next we have the encephalon, another division of the forebrain, which has the following part, which is located here, okay, which has a thalamus and hypothalamus uh, part. So all sensory pathways pass through this uh, thalamus and are related to various areas throughout the brain, in the brain. It's all sensory pathway. Thalamus, okay, this part of the brain, achieves this by filtering incoming information and deciding what to pass and what not to pass on the cortex, onto, onto cortex, and preventing the overload of sensory information. So it acts as also the filter. Okay, uh, thalamus also plays a role in mood and body movement associated with strong emotive response, uh, for instance, fear or rage. So some influence in prefrontal function, such as foresight, and effect, therefore, uh, it's, this function has been implicated as abnormal uh, behavior, in abnormal behavior. So we have another hypothalamus, is another part of the brain, can be thought of as a central control uh, unit of the brain. Okay? So it is located just below the thalamus, it's somewhere here, above the brain stem. So brain stem is uh, over here. And E is what keeps uh, our body um, functioning, right? It functions as a main control center for the uh, for regulating autonomic, emotional, 
and some other uh, somatic functions which is body temperature okay uh, arterial blood pressure thirst uh, also uh, fluid uh, fluid balance those are the main functions of the hypothalamus and it also plays a, a part in primitive states directly involved in stress related uh, or say stress or psychological illness okay? uh, controls emotional and mood relationships so this part of physical okay drives such as hunger um, or coordinates or sleep and wake uh, cycle so basically this is the central control unit the hypothalamus while thalamus is a relay system that pass information <coughs> So remain another uh, part of the brain is called hind brain that consists of the cerebellum and pons. The cerebellum location is here. It's it's also called as a little brain and is located to uh, posterior to the brain uh, stem and it plays as other part of the brain a very important role in sensory uh, perception and fine motor control. So this little brain part, okay, this part. Uh, so cerebellum, this cerebellum has two main functions. First one, oops, uh, to receive input from all sensory sites and project this information to other parts of the uh, brain, such as brainstem and thalamus. Second, cerebellum acts as part of motor system regulating um, balance, equilibrium, uh, and muscle tone. Also, postural control and coordination of uh, voluntary movement. So, realm is a part of the brain which allows us again for fine movements so of balance, right? Regular. Uh, so, pons, which is located here, which is a part of the hind brain, is a main relay station between cerebrum, cerebrum, okay, this is cerebrum, and then um, cerebellum. The majority of brains, non-adrenaline is produced in the uh, locus located within the pons and it helps in regulating uh, arousal and respiration. Further, medulla oblongata, which is located here, acts as a conduction pathway for ascending and descending nerve tracts. Uh, you know, due to consciously control of skeletal muscles and also balance and coordination. So pons and medulla together. Um, and also, what else? So they balance, coordination, regulating sound impulses also related to the function of medulla. Um, regulating autonomic response, such as heart rate, breathing, uh, swallowing, Interesting also vomiting, coughing, sneezing, all these are uh, related to medulla's function. So damage to to this system can uh, re result in coma actually. This is the main area of the brain that uh, brain anesthetic uh, suppressed to put some sleep. So if you, you know stimulating this area of the um, brain results in arousal. In addition, we have a structure called basal ganglia, part of the brain, which consists of several a gray matter structures located in both sides of the brain in cerebrum and in midbrain between the midbrain and the main roles are uh, involved in basal ganglia are to control muscle tone activity posture large muscle movements and um, inhibit some unwanted muscle movement this is the main center of the brain where <coughs> Parkinsonian symptoms originate. Parkinsonian uh, disorder originate due to loss of dopamine. Let's say uh, the, uh, in the substantia, the main dopamine produced in the brain connected to uh, basal uh, ganglia. Further, we differentiate the limbic system that consists of parts called amygdala hippocampus the limbic system which okay amygdala hippocampus some other part 
is the emotional center of the brain. The components of this limbic system help us to regulate our emotions, expression of emotion, and the ability to learn uh, impulses or control impulses. In particular, uh, okay, this part, the amygdala. This is the almond shaped uh, structure located around here, deep in the uh, temporal lobe. This is a half uh, resected cut brain, right? Connected to other parts of the limb system, including the one uh, we discussed hippocampus, thalamus. Uh, the amygdala is also the center for which there are many uh, receptors. So, the studies of damage to amygdala, or to this part of brain, uh, in animals, has elicit violent aggression. Okay? So, hippocampus is also part of the, the limbic system, so amygdala and hippocampus. And it's located around, also close to amygdala, around this here. It contains a, a large quantity of neurotransmitters and its main function appear to be memory. So, particularly to turning short-term memory into long-term memory. The damage to the hippocampus can lead to disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, so memory-related disease, brain disorder. Now let me briefly talk about uh, protection and then blood supply to the to the brain. So let's take a look at this image. This is the brain, and then the brain is protected by several uh, layers structure. So what we can see here is on the on the top we have the skin, right, and some other structures, and the bone, the skull, and the meninges consists of three structures, dura matter, arachnoid matter, matter and pia matter. And also we have some, uh, this is uh, the brain tissue, gray matter, and this is called as cerebrospinal fluid. This is a fluid, some, some fluid that is used in, uh, also known as CSF, in the protection and the regulation of the brain. So, <coughs> Okay, this is a bone, right? The, the, the thickest structure. Well, let's take a look at this dura matter. Okay. This dura matter is the outer, the layer of protection, and also known as a hard mother. It is uh, tough and inflexible. Second, okay, together, the second important one is pia matter. Um, okay, dura pia is the inner layer of the protection, also known as tender mother. It's a thin, it's also like a mesh, like a substance covering the brain. This is the brain. This is the brain. And this uh, this fluid, this is cerebrospinal fluid, uh, is located uh, with some space between dura and pia. Okay, dura and pia. Pia is this layer. This is a fluid. So CSF, in short, has two main functions. It acts as a shock absorber when you hit something with your head. Okay, CSF will try to uh, absorb the shock. And the brain floats in CSF, lessening the, uh, the forceful shift in your of the brain on movement. It also kind of meditates between blood vessels and brain, brain tissue in exchange of nutrients. So CSF has uh, many uh, functions. There are several chambers within the brain that fill with CSF fluid. We also have blood-brain barrier, which is a kind of membrane structure that acts to protect the brain from chemicals in the blood while still allowing essential metabolic functions. The wall of the blood-brain barrier is made up of endothelial cells with a very tightly packed 
capillaries protecting the brain. Therefore, the brain needs to utilize other carriers in order to uh, transport nutrients into the brain. Because of the uh, blood-brain barrier, many drugs which are intended to treat the uh, central nervous system, the brain diseases, have difficulty getting into the brain in necessary quantity to be effective. Well, knowing these outer layers are useful in PCI, BMI, uh, their detailed functions are the question of uh, neuroscience, right? Neuroscience, more related to neuroscience studies. But as engineers, we are we need to be aware of this uh, layer structure and then know that the the signal that is picked up here has to pass through several layers and on the way it may be uh, attenuated filtered out especially by the bone the skull that is another reason why the signal acquired from the skin or from the skull is blurred or has very poor spatial resolution because the, the source of activity is here but the location of the sensor is here so the field, electrical magnetic field, should pass through the, the several layer structure. Let's take a look at the structure of a neuron, which is elementary building block of the brain uh, tissue. So neuron uh, consists of several parts. This part is called cell body, this part. And it contains a cell nucleus and is the life blood of the cell. Okay, so we also have other parts, dendrites, called dendrites. These are these, uh, these kind, uh, these uh, branches, which receives, uh, which is a receptive surface of the neuron, and receives information from the uh, other neurons. Basically, this is the input to the neuron. We also have this axon, okay, which carries nerve impulses from cell body to other neurons to other neurons axon hillock is where the nerve impulse originates and passes through the axon and we have axon terminal which is basically the location of the synapse okay so uh, these are the synapse this ends the axon terminal so myelin we have here my, myelin sheaths. It's a fatty insulation around axon. So uh, it works as an improvement or, or the speed of production, improve the speed of production. So let's take a look at a simple uh, membrane of a neuron and then try to figure out how the process of uh, interneuron communication happens. So first, we note that some molecules need to be negatively charged and others uh, positively charged due to a few electrons and when molecules are dissolved in fluid they're called uh, ions right so ions these are these dot i mean dot circles i mean circle object in this figure uh, uh, this is inside the cell outside the cell okay have negative charge attracting negative charged cells where ions in the extracellular fluid outside the cell have a positive charge attracting which attracts positively charged cells so also known as cations or anions making the potential difference between inside and outside of the cell other uh, forces that play a role in neuronal signals are concentration gradient uh, ions that move from high concentration to low concentration and selectively um, and ability for ions to cross the cell membrane more uh, readily than others. These ions, is, there are several of them, but common ones are sodiums, potassium, calcium, and all have specific molecular channels in which they can uh, pass through. So channels Again, channels, interesting. They are kind of gates or voltage, uh, gated, um, gated voltage. 
meaning they open and close these kind of channels okay, in response to change in the electrical potential across the membrane inside or outside the cell. At rest, we have the cell membrane kept, uh, cell membrane potential is kept even by the distribution of uh, potassium and sodium ions because the membrane is not impermeable to sodium. A okay, small amount of sodium can leak inside the cell and sodium potassium uh, pump, actively pump the sodium out, the, out of the cell. Well, while replacing the potassium, uh, keeping the distribution even. So two, pro produce an electrical signal along axon. Okay, the cell needs to produce action potential. Okay, so here, the cell needs to produce action potential in order to pass it, uh, the, the trans new information to the adjacent neurons. Um, so. And at rest, cell membrane is kept uh, even, as I said, by distribution of potassium and sodium. And action potential, which is okay, um, signal, okay, is a brief charge in neuronal uh, polarization that travels rapidly along the axon. We can also call it as um, electrical signal. And action potential uh, occurs when the membrane of cells becomes depolarized. That, that means the inner membrane surface becomes less negative in relation to the outer surface. So, so this is called as depolarized or depolarization. The, this okay, reaches a threshold okay, um, and which can trigger the opening of sodium uh, channels along the uh, sodium to surge into the cell creating a brief positive charge inside the cell and negative charge out the cell. Okay, after this, potassium channels open, repolarizing the cell until all gates close and the cell returns to its resting potential. So basically, it's interplay between repolarization and uh, depolarization. Okay, and uh, these gates act as uh, like opens and close, pass and change the distribution of um, negatively charged and positively charged, uh, charged ions. For example, here briefly shown how this action potential is generated. Right, so here we have um, potassium and this is sodium and the, these are the ions, okay? So this is resting potential, okay? And then when we have sufficient amount of depolarization uh, of the axon, it results in increase of the, the action potential. So this is again opens, close, uh, open and close potassium and sodium channels. So the phase resting state, second, we have uh, which channel? So sodium open, uh, potassium closed, and region three is we have inactivated uh, sodium channels. So basically the interplay between uh, the, the concentration level of ions generate this kind of signal. So we have a, another process called synaptic transmission. So what, when one neuron sends the action potential, what happens at the action terminal? Uh, let's take a look. So synaptic transmission is a process in which the nerve impulse, impulses, the action potentials, move from one cell to another cell. So from one cell to another cell. For one neuron, to communicate with another neuron, the electrical process previously described must change to a chemical communication. This occurs at the synaptic cleft. This is a synaptic cleft, which is a junction between one nerve cell to uh, to another through a substance called substances called neurotransmitters. Okay, these are. Um, sample neurotransmitters. Those are some molecules. When uh, electrical impulse reaches the end of the axon terminal here, the calcium ion channels open, stimulating the release of neurotransmitters. These are the release of the neurotransmitters. 
intersynapse, which are stored in small uh, so-called vesicles near the end of the axon. When simulated or stimulated by the use of by the release of calcium into the cell, these vesicles fuse to the cell membrane and release into synapse, crossing the synaptic cleft to a receptor site. To, uh, this receptor acts uh, act as lock locks for certain neurotransmitters. We know those uh, neurotransmitters that are uh, popular: dopamine. Maybe you have heard, um, uh, and so those kind of dopamine receptors only lock into dopamine neurotransmitters due to the key okay, in the synapse. So receptor cells stimulated by a neurotransmitter then responds by producing its own action potential. Okay, after action potential. And these are produce an action or act as a relay station, sending the message through the pathway of uh, neurons. When neuro, this kind of neurotransmitters has completed its journey across synapse, it needs to be removed. Well, this is done uh, by being broken down by enzymes uh, in the cleft. Um, okay, and we also have uh, many uh, drugs or pharma pharmacological agents block this process, increasing amount of neurotransmitters in the synapse available. So finally, let me just briefly describe what excitatory and inhibitory synapse. There are two different types of synapses. So excitatory synapse causes a postsynaptic cell to become less negative, which also triggers, triggers excitatory postsynaptic potential. So it's also known as EPSP. While inhibitory synapse causes the postsynaptic cell potential to be negative, which triggers inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So inhibitory and excitatory or postsynapse we have. Depending, yes, EPSP e and IPSP, inhibitor postsynaptic potentials, and their summation represent basically the um, EEG signal. So we will see. So EPSP and IPFC, IPSP, excitatory inhibitory, post-synaptic potential. So these potentials are happening after the synapse, okay, in, around here. So if we assume uh, pre-synapse, pre-synapse, I mean synapses, before uh, coming to this neuron, this is neuron, A, B, C, assume, right? So this one is called, assume uh, A is EPSP, B is EPSP, and uh, C is IPSP. Well, depending on this uh, interaction of these three, the membrane potentials change. For instance, again, excitatory synapse cause the post-synaptic cell to become less negative. Okay, well, triggering excitatory post-synaptic potential, which increases the likelihood of firing an action potential, so EPSP. While inhibitory synapses cause the post-synaptic potential cell uh, cell potential to become neg negative triggering inhibitory. So less negative, more negative. Okay, these are becomes uh, less negative, more negative. Triggers inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So inhibitory usually decreases the likelihood of firing an action potential. Right, action potential is a kind of rapid uh, transient. It's an, it looks like this. So uh, all or none nerve impulse and which can be measured at, so we can measure this action potential as well as um, the combination of inhibitory or excitatory postsynaptic potentials. So look, this graph shows the, the potential, membrane potential, in order of microvolts. So resting state, uh, resting potential before these things happen is around minus 70 microvolt. This is membrane potential of a neuron when it's not being triggered, affected by other neurons. When A starts to uh, change or affect or cause postsynaptic cell to become less negative, this is uh, EPSP, then we have an uh, increase in the voltage here, A, and then B fires, I mean, we have impulse coming from the previous neuron, and then B comes another one, and when, when C, Inhibitory, post uh, inhibitory synapse effects and we have 
going down again. So when A and B okay, transmits action potential from the uh, previous neurons, then together, when they fight together, when they we see some increase or summation, spatial summation. All right? And when we have A, B, C, so, uh, some other okay, synaptic potential uh, affecting or changing the polarization membrane, then the action potential fires when it passes from some certain threshold. Okay, and this action potential is basically one of the uh, process that uh, okay, explains neuronal firing. So in the coming lectures, I will explain further how this EPSP and IPSP uh, represents the recorded uh, brain data from outside the scalp, in, in particular electroencephalographic signals. So today's lecture was basically a quick overview of a human brain and its functions, okay, and study of brain and neurophysiology are very huge topics. But here I tried I just tried to cover the some uh, general background that may be useful in our BCI studies. Okay, so you can go through these um, references to find more, and if you if you need, okay, uh, some other okay references, let me know. You can always uh, send me the question, okay, um, using Telegram or email. I think that's it for today. I will see you around uh, online again.